Hope you all have your Bibles with you. What would a Christian do without a Bible? It's amazing to realize that it's amazing to realize that there are over a hundred million Bibles or parts of Bibles sold every year throughout the world. It is the most distributed book of any book ever published. And unfortunately, the, the least read. And you might think it's, you might wonder about my title, The Miracle Bible Translation. You know, we take for granted that the Bible's always been in English. But the reality is, is that it hasn't been. And we want to look a little bit at the history of the Bible. Whenever someone asks me, can you really trust the Bible? My answer is, I trust it with my life. But how much of the Bible do we really know? I'm going to share with you some insights that children give us about the Bible. Insights that children give us about the Bible. First is that Solomon, one of David's sons, had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. And Moses died before he reached Texas. Then Jacob led the Hebrews into the Battle of Jericho. And Noah's wife's name was Joan of Arc. Jesus was born because Mary had an immaculate contraption. Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a fireball by night. And the last one, a Republican is a sinner mentioned in the Bible. Children have amazing insights, don't they? Now, came across a, a quotation that said that, that half of Americans read their Bibles. Isn't that encouraging? Half of Americans read, pray, or listen to the Word of God. Isn't that great? Now you're a little hesitant because you think there must be some catch. Well, the catch is that it's three or four times a year. And someone has said that they would, we would experience the worst dust storm in America if everybody dusted off their Bibles at the same time. The story is told of, a, um, of an actor, auditor from England, who was well famous at the time when he was doing his presentations. And he would amaze the audiences. At the end of one of his presentations, he asked the audience, if there was anything special that they would like to hear him perform. And an old pastor raised his hand and said, how about the 23rd Psalm? And the actor thought for a few seconds, he said, I'm willing to do it if you will repeat the 23rd Psalm after me. And so the pastor agreed. And the actor performed, his, everything that he did was perfect. And when he was done, the audience erupted with applause. Then it was time for the, the senior pastor to get up. His performance was not nearly as immaculate as the actor. And when he was done, there was no applause. But there was also not a dry tear in the audience. And the actor got up and he said, I know the 23 song, 23rd song. But this pastor knows the shepherd of the 23rd song. And that's the important part of spending time with God's Word, Amen. is getting to know God. If you open your Bibles back to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, you know, Paul gives us a, a powerful insight in the importance of our spending time in His Word. 
Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. I know if you're looking at that screen, you're probably saying, what in the world is that? When I was in El Salvador, Bob Falkenberg Jr.'s son was preaching in one of our churches, and their churches are all in Spanish. And he had a, he had a tract on me. When he was done, one of the church members raised their hand and said, what is that on the screen? And he had accidentally flipped the language to Russian. And no, one, no one said anything. This is not Russian, but I will, I do promise you, I'll explain it to you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Paul tells us that God's word is not, this is not a dead book, but that it's living and that it's powerful. And it gives us a sense of direction. It gives us a, a sense of understanding of what our purpose is in life. The Bible pierces our heart, touches our souls, and changes the direction of our life. The Apostle Peter, if you flip over to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, Peter tells us that this book that we call the Bible is not a man-made Concoctions. He said, First Peter, chapter, excuse me, Second Peter, chapter one, verse twenty-one. For, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is God's word for our lives. Without it, we don't have an understanding. A clear understanding of what the meaning of our life is. We don't have a clear sense of what his vision and mission, mission is for our life. And we certainly can't understand the plan of salvation without his word. Someone has said, without the scripture, the God you worship is the God of your imagination. I'm going to look a few minutes this morning at the history of the English Bible. Because all of us have been exposed to the Bible in, in our language. But there was a long period of time, a very dark period of time, when this was the language that the Bible was available in. Now there might be one of two of you here who have a, a Spanish background who can possibly read this. This is the Latin Vulgate. Now, The first Bible translation was the Septuagint. The Bible is in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. The Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Pope Damascus I, in 382, asked St. Jerome to translate the Bible into Latin. Because at one time, Greek was very common in Western Europe. By, the, by 382, Greek had disappeared from Western Europe. And so Jerome was given the job of translating the Bible into Latin, which was the common language of Europe, at least among the educated and the elite. Now, one of the things the church fathers didn't like, they expected Jerome to translate the Bible in Latin from the Septuagint, but instead he translated it from the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, which would make for a better translation. And, and something, oh, you, yeah, you can tell from here. One thing you'll notice there are two things that are missing. There are no scripture verses, and there are no chapter headings. There's no chapters one, two, three, four, five. They they did break the sections up into smaller sections. But Bible verses, that didn't come into existence for several, many, several years. In fact, the, the Latin Vulgate Bible was the only available translation for over a thousand years. So from the third, almost the fourth century, 
to almost the 15th century. Anybody yet figured out what this says? John 3.16. John 3.16, yes. I'm trying to give you a clue of what it might be. But you imagine living in Europe, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th century, and the only Bible available was in Latin? And you can only read English? You can, you can imagine the, the significant challenge that was. Now, this was true until John Wycliffe come, came along. John Wycliffe was a priest. But it didn't stop him from speaking out against the sins of the church. He was, was a devout man of God, and that he's referred to as the morning star of the Reformation. In his era, the noblemen, the educated noblemen, they read and wrote in French. And all church documents were in Latin. English was viewed as an inferior language, really only relevant for peasants. Imagine what it must have been like, how discouraging it must have been, how, how hard it must have been to understand God's will for your life when you don't have a Bible you can read. And if you lived in the time of the Latin Vulgate, you probably were a peasant. You probably worked for landowners. And in 1348, the Babonic Plague struck England. One out of every four of your relatives one of our, one of out of every four or three of your relatives or friends would die because of the bubonic plague. And, and, and try to imagine you have no Bible to read to to understand where is God in the midst of all of this tragedy? And because you also want a better life. And the only person you can go to is the priest, and, and the priest is offended if you ask him to explain the word of God to you. Because many of the priests only could read small portions of the Latin Vulgate, just enough to do the service. God always has a plan. And one of those plans was John, John Wycliffe. Because Wycliffe believed that not the Pope, but that the Bible was our authority. And if the Bible was our authority, then Wycliffe said, we need a Bible that we can read. A Bible written in English. Now the Germans already had one. Luther had already translated the Bible in German. Nobody had translated it into English. And so Wycliffe began to study. And the unfortunate thing is, because Greek was no longer taught in the universities, Wycliffe didn't know Greek or Hebrew. And so he began his English translation from the faulty Vulgate translation. And they began translating. And one of the problems with the Vulgate or the Latin translation coming into English, and I didn't realize this, but in Latin there's no definite article. Anybody know what a definite article is? Pardon? The. Yes, yeah, can you imagine? For God love world. There are 20,000 definite articles in the Greek. Michael didn't have access to these. But he gave us. And, and one of the other problems, there was no printing press when Michael was alive. So how do you think he created his Bibles? By hand. It would take up to a year to try
translate one <coughs> Bible from the Latin to the English. The good news is there were over a thousand translations made available in English, but they were so expensive and so huge that the average person didn't have one. Now, 1384, Wycliffe passed away. Forty years later, the church was still so angry at Wycliffe, they dug up his bones, ground them up, and put them in the, into the river. I don't know if maybe they thought that God couldn't resurrect him if his bones were all destroyed. I don't know what they're thinking he was, but they did. After Wycliffe's Bible, 130 years would pass, and then an amazing Bible translator would come on the scene by the name of William Tyndall. Now there's two other things that would happen, two other major events that God made sure it took place. One was the invention of the printing press, the Gutenberg Press. What do you think the first book was published on his press? The Bible. Unfortunately, it was the Latin Bible, but it was the first Bible. It was the first book he ever published, was the Bible. 42,000 pieces of wood he had to cut to produce that on his Bible. But the second thing that happened, 1453, the Turks invaded the Byzantine Empire. Now, you wonder why, why that's so significant. Well, when they invaded Constantine's old empire, where Greek was still being spoken, many of those Greek scholars fled the Byzantine Empire and went to Western Europe. And within five years, Greek was for the first time being taught in the universities. And so William Tyndall became a student of Greek. Now don't answer this, it's Jesus. It's all right. It happens to a lot of us. So, before Tyndall comes on the scene, God has provided us with a printing machine, and God has provided us with access to Greek. Now, Tyndall had to leave England for a couple of reasons. One, he feared for his life, because it was against the law, ordered by the church, it was against the law to own or read an English-speaking Bible, or an English Bible. And secondly, Tyndall couldn't find anybody in England who knew Hebrew. So he went to Germany and he found some rabbis who taught him Bible Hebrew. So that Tyndall could translate an English Bible from the original Greek and the original Hebrew. He, he presented to the world the first Greek New Testament in English from the original Greek. Unfortunately, he didn't finish the Old Testament. He got about the Second Chronicles because Tyndall was burned at the stake. The church was doing everything it could to keep the English Bible suppressed. Ten, hundreds of thousands of men and women lost their lives trying to provide us with an English reading Bible. So in 1535, the church burned him at the stake, and his dying words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes to the English Bible. And so Tyndall's Bible was the first English New Testament in the, after the age of printing, and it was the first English New Testament translated directly from the Greek. And it was the first translation to include italicis. And Chuck, does your translation have italicis? Anybody know what italicis is for? Supply words, but they, you know, some, some Greek words are called idioms, and there's no real good English translation, so that's where you see the italicis. And, for one more, Tyndall's 
translation had a heavy influence on the King James Bible. Now, after Tyndall passed away, three new translations came on the, on the scene. There was the Cloverdale translation by Miles Cloverdale. He was an assistant of Tyndall's, and he published it. It was the, it was the most innovative thing the Bible was that, that took place because for the first time, the Apocrypha was moved from inside the Old Testament that was available and moved to the end of the Old Testament. Everybody know what the Apocrypha is? Anybody not know what the Apocrypha is? Okay. The next translation that came on the scene was the Matthew's Bible. The one thing that the Matthew's Bible included, the Matthew's was also a revision of, the, of Tyndall's Bible. It was the first Bible to have added notes and became viewed as a study Bible. Its nickname is the Wife Beater Bible. If you turn to 1 Peter 3 7, First Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. In Roger's notes to the side of 1 Peter 3 7, he wrote, If the wife be not obedient and helpful to her husband, he endeavoreth to beat the fear of God into her. Aren't you glad that's not in there anymore? A lot of his notes were controversial, like that one. And Rogers would become one of the first martyrs after the printing press um, in the hands of Queen Mary. And then the next one was the Great Bible, printed in 1539. It was the first Bible that the king gave permission for everybody to read. And it was called the Great Bible, not because it was a great translation, but because it was so huge. In fact, they chained these Bibles to the pulpits, but someone said, you know, they were so heavy, even a thief couldn't take them. And the Matthew's Bible is another revision of the Tyndall's Bible. One of the challenges that takes place in the 1500s is that the King of England, who had been pro-Protestant, suddenly becomes pro-Catholic and persecution begins taking place again. And it was forbidden to read the Cloverdale Bible, and it was forbidden to read the Matthews Bible, but it was okay to read the Great Bible, which is kind of ironic because the Great Bible really was the Cloverdale and the Matthew Bible. There really was another translation, or another revision of the Tyndall's Bible. Then came the Geneva Bible. Now the reason it's called in Geneva is because a lot of the scholars who were under persecution fled England and went to Geneva and began their translation. Now by this time, King Henry the Sixth, oh, excuse me, Edward the Sixth, Henry's son, was the king and he was pro-Protestant. Then he passed away and he was replaced by Queen Mary, better known as Bloody Mary. And thousands upon thousands were burned at the stake. Many of them, they would hang their Bibles around their neck as they were, as they were being persecuted and, and just, as they were being executed. She systematically was determined to remove Protestantism from England. And so many of those scholars, like I said, fled. They fled to Geneva, which is where John Calvin was, and they began producing what we call today the, the Geneva Bible. And it also had a lot of notes, and because it was done in Geneva, because they were under the influence of John Calvin, a lot of those notes were Calvinistic. But even this Bible was still heavily dependent upon Tyndall's translation. And the Geneva Bible, this is the first Bible where Bible verses are included and chapter titles are included, chapters 1, 2, 3, etc. This is the Geneva Bible, 1557. This is the first time we see those two qualities. 
And then we have the King James Bible. Now the Geneva Bible remained popular even 50 years after the King James Bible. And the Geneva Bible, one of the, two of the things that are unique about it is that all the other Bibles before this were huge. They were not really portable, not something you carry around and give a Bible study. The Geneva Bible is the first small Bible. And it is the Bible that the pilgrims brought with them when they came to the United States. It's also the Bible that Shakespeare used. So the king said, in the church, you'll read the Great Bible. In your homes, you'll read the Geneva Bible. And that was true until King James came on the scene. King James wanted his own translation, and he wanted a translation that didn't have notes on it. He didn't like all those Calvinistic notes. And one of the things about this Geneva Bible, if you turn to chapter 3 of Genesis and verse 7, Translators are not perfect. And so the Geneva Bible became known as the Bridges Bible. And in Genesis 3, verse 7, it says, Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together and made them into bridges. And so it became known as the Bridges Bible. Between Geneva Bible and the King James was the Dewey Bible. Catholic Church decided if you can't beat them, then join them. And they decided that they wanted their own English Bible. And they wanted to be sure it said what they wanted it to say. And to be sure it included the Apocrypha. Which brings us down to the King James Bible. Someone asked, sometimes asked me, which is the best Bible translation? My answer is always the same, the one that you're willing to read. That's the best Bible translation. And it's good to have multiple translations to be able to compare a text from one translation to another. Some of them have certain faults, and you need to be aware of those. Certain, some have certain strengths, and it's good to be aware of those. But from 1382 to 1610, God began the process of giving English-speaking people a Bible in their language so that we could advance the kingdom of heaven. The Bible is, is a unique book. It addresses hundreds of subjects that are relevant to us, that were relevant 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, and are still relevant today. Subjects so like marriage, subjects so like human homosexuality, or greed, or ecology, or labor unions, or just name a few. The Bible never becomes irrelevant. It is always current, and it is always important for us. The Bible is God's unfolding story of His plan of salvation, of His plan of redemption. Genesis, we have the paradise lost. The book of Revelation, we have the paradise regained. In April 2011, a deadly tornado came across Alabama, killing 250 people. Near Wellington, Alabama, the Hardy family realized they were in trouble. They had a metal shed. They thought they would go to that for safety, but that shed had already been destroyed. So the only thing they could think to do was to grab ropes and went into a stand of trees and tied themselves to those trees while the hurricane, while the tornado passed. And they said that they did get some scratches, some bruises, but they survived. Can you imagine that? Surviving? the power of a tornado. But we need to be tied to God's word. There are tornadoes all around us. There are temptations and trials and difficulties. The devil is constantly throwing at us and our only safety is God's word. And when you view the Bible as a lifeline, 
designed to keep you safe through the storms, you begin to take it more seriously. So I hope, hope it wasn't too boring, I just love history. But to recognize the, the, the value of the English Bible and the rivers of blood that have flowed to provide us with this amazing book in our language. I encourage my counsel to you.